Gore Podcast. This is your host, Lori Gore. I'm giving you information that's factually correct and politically incorrect. More bounce to the ounce. More bounce to the ounce. More bounce to the ounce. It's okay. More bounce to the ounce. So this week, I said that I was going to have a surprise topic. And uh, I had my little uh, my little Price is Right wheel that I had to spin around out of the many topics that I chose to surprise you guys with this week. The topic is... Jerry Curls, Trends, and Groupthink. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite hairdos, Jerry Curl. It's history, uh, popularity, uh, some of its famous wearers, uh, my history with it, and just the amount of groupthink that's endemic with American blacks. Here we go. So the history of the Jerry Curl follows as this. A man named William Jerry Redding was an entrepreneur in cosmetology. Um, he acquired these skills during the Great Depression. Thanks FDR for extending the Great Depression for an additional like 10 years due to government intervention. That's, that's a story for another podcast. So Jerry Redding acquired these skills because he saw that even in uh, times of poverty and dysfunction and uh, you know, a deep depression, literally it's called the Great Depression, he saw that people still wanted to look good, you know, women wanted to have nice hair and nice makeup, so on and so forth. So uh, he acquired these um, beautician skills, he became a cosmetologist, uh, and he was a pioneer and an innovator in this field and in hair care as well. Not only is he credited for creating the Jerry Curl process, he was the first to make pH balance shampoos that match the mild acidity of human skin. Uh, he was the first to put vitamins and hair care products into market added minerals. And he pitched these benefits with evangelistic fervor at conventions of hair salon owners and some who he helped make millionaires by marketing his products. So this guy was a big shot. He was an entrepreneur. He was an innovator. This man was a hard worker, a very smart, brave, industrious man. Uh, the cold wave permanent process was invented in 1938 by Arnold F. Willett. So the Jerry Curl is, is a cold wave, which is why um, perhaps Jerry Redding created some of these products to make it look this way. Maybe he was an innovator there, but the actual cold wave process that the Jerry Curl is based off of was created in 1938. So essentially what they do is, you know, one, they use a chemical to straighten your hair, then they wash that out. Two, they, uh, they section your hair and they roll it in these perm rods and put a uh, chemical on that and have that sit for a while. Then they wash it out with the rods in. Then they uh, put neutralizer in your hair. Um, that's to make the hair form like the rods. Keep that in for a little while, wash it out. Then once they take it out, your hair looks like this. Uh, that usually takes a few hours. Um, but he was the, the creator of that process. Uh, Comer Cottrell, a black conservative, is the person who brought the curl to the black masses in the early 80s. Uh, he had a hair care line called Proline. And uh, his, uh, his home curly kit was a, um, was a huge step in making this process affordable to the masses because, you know, when the Jerry Curl initially became popular, it was really for the, the rich and famous, the well-to-do black people. You know, a curl would cost about two to three hundred dollars. And that's in the early 80s money. So today that's probably around four to five hundred dollars to get it done. And obviously most black people couldn't afford that. So this man, uh, he had his hair care company and he saw opportunity. He saw that the process wasn't that hard to do. And uh, he made it accessible. He sold these hair care kits, these home kits for eight dollars a box. And he made four dollars profit off each box. And I was reading somewhere online that, you know, at the heyday, of the Jerry Curl's popularity probably in the early to mid 80s, they said one out of four black people had a Jerry Curl. So that was mostly due to Comer Cottrell's um, innovation in making the, the pro product cheaper and more accessible. I mean, he found a market, 
He found uh, a way to supply what people wanted at prices that they're willing to afford. He made himself very rich and the people who were making his products very prosperous and the people who wanted the products benefited as well. No one lost there. So uh, some of the famous wearers of this hairstyle was, of course, Michael Jackson. It was a very famous one. Uh, Lionel Richie. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Um... Ready for the World, the band Ready for the World, they were known for that. Um, a lot of Dominican baseball players, uh, Pedro Martinez, uh, Pascual Perez, Jose Mesa, even Sammy Sosa for a brief period. Uh, Luther Vandross, uh, Eric Dickerson, Dion Sanders, uh, Emerson Moises Costa, he was a Brazilian uh, football player who was very famous uh, overseas in England, so on and so forth. Uh, Bootsy Collins, uh, and also uh, various uh, black rednecks um, all across you know the West Coast, Compton, L.A., Long Beach, so on and so forth. So you know a lot of people made this this hairstyle very popular. Uh, it's very desirable. Uh, it was it was a hairstyle of the the rich and prosperous. And I talked about fashion in an earlier podcast. Now people aspire to uh, look like the the successful famous people, and a lot of famous successful people were wearing that hairstyle. So. Naturally, a lot of people wanted to follow suit. Uh, the time period it was really popular was, I guess, the beginning of the 80s. Uh, throughout the 80s, maybe like in the late 80s, like 87, 88, it stopped being as popular as it was. Uh, people started lampooning it in, in movies like Coming to America. Funny movie. Uh, it started being lampooned. Uh, I know a Robert Townsend movie called Hollywood Squares had lampooned it as well. Um... Yeah, and, and, and by like the early 90s, there are few people that are wearing it outside of uh, black rednecks and gangbangers on the uh, you know, le- the West Coast, you know, L.A., Compton, Long Beach, uh, Watts. <laughs> um, but people like Barry White, he kept his until he died. Uh, Jimmy Jam wore his for a long time. Very nice hair, very beautiful hair. So they didn't really fall into the group thing. And uh, they weren't pressured into stop doing what they wanted to do based on what other people were saying. So, my history uh, with the hairstyle goes as follows. Uh, you know, earlier in my youth, I was uh, much more enamored with black rednecks and black redneck culture uh, than I am now. I'm, I'm an ardent critic of it. I think it's one of the most destructive uh, things in the United States today. But, um, you know, I used to watch movies like uh, Menace to Society and, and Boys in the Hood. So on and so forth, and I saw this hairstyle, and uh, it really struck struck me, and I liked it, and I would think to myself, "Hey, why isn't anyone doing that? You know, these guys have these nice, beautiful uh, curls in their hair. You know, they're glamorous and they're shiny and they're all pretty, and I just didn't understand why people stopped doing that. So I did research on it as a kid, and I wanted to get one, but my parents said no. Um, they just just didn't, didn't allow me to do it." Uh, and a little bit later in my life, uh, my first year in college, you know, I started looking up these, these baseball players again, and uh, I started watching those movies again, and uh, I had the same feeling that I had many years uh, prior to that, and I saw this hairdo, and it was just beautiful and, and glossy and glamorous, and it, it was the juxtaposition that was... Uh, <laughs> That was interesting to me. You had these these criminals and these uh these vagabonds and derelicts, you know, committing crimes and engaging in various forms of skullduggery, but they had this very pretty hairdo. You know, it's all glossy and glamorous, and I was like, man, that is incredible. Like, I want to get me one of those things. And uh, you know, for a a good part of my life, I would say from the beginning of high school to the end of college, I wore a ball cap every day. I mean, I still have an armory just filled with ball caps. I still like ball caps. I just don't wear them anymore because it just doesn't fit my MO, you know, other than if I'm working out in the yard or working out outside, I don't wear ball caps anymore. They don't really go with slacks and polished shoes and collared shirts, you know. (laughs) But, um, you know, I saw these guys and, you know, they had this beautiful hair coming out of these baseball caps and I wore baseball caps. So I was like, man, why don't I start doing that? You know, I saw people like Deion Sanders and Pedro Martinez and, and uh, Jose Mesa and Juan Guzman and Jeronimo Barroa. You know, I really started looking this stuff up and I'm like, why did they stop doing that? 
and just looking it up, I'll discuss a little later in the podcast, just looking it up, all the reasons why people stop doing it basically amounted to, hey, you can't do that anymore because we say that's not cool. And if you know me, I make decisions for myself and I just didn't buy it. So what I did was um, I went to the swap meet and I bought this wig and I had my sister cut it to the way like those ball players would wear it. And I kind of wore it as a joke. You know, like I would wear my ball caps and go around with this hair as a joke and see how many people actually thought that that was my hair. And it was also a pilot test for me wearing that hairdo in real life, you know, um, because I was so interested and enamored with this hairstyle. I thought, hey, I might as well, you know, pull this joke with this wig and see what it would actually look like had I got it in real life. And I liked it. I mean, I forgot how long I wore the wig, but I threw it out a long time ago. But I liked it, and then I just started growing my hair. And uh, in December 2012, I went to the hair salon and got it done, and I've been going there ever since. For almost six years, I've been doing it. Like I said, I don't wear the ball caps anymore, um, but I made it grow really long. Um, I won't get it too, too long. You know, I'll cut it down, but I like my hair long and lustrous and glamorous. And it's a really uh, low-maintenance hairstyle. It's not that expensive to get it done. You know, I said earlier that when it started, it cost two to $300 to do. It cost me $60, and I do it every two months. And of course, you have to buy like the moisturizer and the spray, so on and so forth. But uh, it's, it's really cheap, it's really economical, and most importantly, I really like it. So let's talk about individualism and groupthink, because I did a lot of research on this hairstyle, uh, not only then, but for this podcast, and then you see a lot of like these black establishment websites, and they're talking about things like, oh, it was an embarrassing history for us that we wore Jerry Curl. Uh, a lot of people hide pictures of them with this Jerry Curl. How could we ever put that in our hair? I don't know who we is. I'm not part of some we or some us. I'm Gordon. I'm Lord Gord. I think for myself. I uh, evaluate ideas based on facts and evidence based on pros and cons, and then I make my decision. I don't make my decision based off what some black rednecks think. You know, I don't make my decision based off some, some, some collective high race socialist mind that most blacks in America subscribe to. So uh, I thought it was nonsense. Um, so many of them would say, oh, you know, the hairdo drips, and, uh, you know, it drips and gets on clothes and stuff. Now listen, I used to wear ball caps sometimes, I would take a little while to put the ball cap on because when you put the, the product in your hair, yeah, your hair is wet. I mean, the, the, the purpose of the style is to wear your hair in a wet, curly style. You know, even people who have natural uh, curls, like I've seen, like my aunt, her hair naturally looks like this. To have it look like this, you have to put water or some product that simulates moisture because if it's not moist, it'll be poofy. So I don't understand how people can say, oh, we didn't like it being wet. When the purpose of the hairdo is to have a wet, defined curl look. It doesn't make any sense. Especially the fact that, you know, the, the, these black women buy like these Brazilian wet and wavy uh, weaves that look just like this. It's like crazy. Okay. So I was talking about how people turn against this hairstyle. And it's just very strange. Um, yeah, my hair has never dripped before. You know, I really think that that's a hyperbole or a myth. You know, I've seen so many people uh, sweat and their hair wasn't dripping. I mean, when I work out, I ride bikes and lift weights. You know, I sweat, but my hair doesn't drip. I was watching a Barry White performance uh, last night. He had this nice jerry curl, even though his, he's sweating profusely. His hair's not dripping. I've seen Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis perform at Janet Jackson. They perform at the time. Never saw their hair drip one time, um, even though it looks wet and lustrous uh i've seen ready for the world in their music videos never seen their hair drip i mean of course you see stuff like coming to america and you, you put your head on something and it leaves a mark that has some validity to it um you know if, if i if, it's just like if you put hair grease in your hair or any type of butter or lotion in your hair when that's in your hair and it touches something some of that stuff is going to get on there so that has a uh, some basis in reality so you know, say if I'm in my car, I don't really put my head all the way back on the uh, the headrest, but I've never seen anyone who drives who puts their head all the way back. I've never seen that. I mean, when I sleep, I put like a... Some, some days I put 
uh, a cap on my head to keep the moisture. But some days I don't. You know, when it's drier, I don't. And I can sleep on it and it doesn't mess up my pillows or anything like that. But I can see how it could if you had a bunch of hair product in there. And, uh, you know, when I talk about groupthink, it's incredible just how trends work in general. How you have a lot of people doing one thing, and then like the next day, like like they're like ants in a colony, they just move in a completely different direction. And a lot of people who I've talked to ask questions to, you know, why did you get rid of your curl? Most of them just said, hey, other people stopped doing it. You know, Juan Guzman, the, the ball player for the Toronto Blue Jays, he won a World Series with the Blue Jays. He was asked many years later, you know, where's your, where's your curl? What, what happened to your curl? And he said, you know, we don't do that anymore. Like I said earlier, who is we? Are, are you part of some, some, some hive mind where you, you only do things because others do them? And, and I don't really respect people too much who just blindly follow trends. You know, I respect people who look at ideas, they test the validity of ideas, they look at the facts and the evidence, uh, they look at both sides of the argument, and then they make a decision. I mean, people, so what you're telling me is that a lot of these people, uh, they didn't get the Jericho because they liked it. Well, maybe some of them did like it, but they mostly got it because that was popular, that was the end thing to do, and they started doing it. Um... And they stopped doing it because someone else told them that they can't do that anymore? Or did they stop doing it because they didn't like it? I'm pretty sure there, there's a bit of both, but... Dude, you're going to stop doing something because someone pointed their finger at you? What kind of man are you? You know, men, men, a man that stands for nothing will fall for anything. Uh, and, and like I was talking about this whole black establishment, this hive thing, where you have to have certain political opinions, certain economical opinions... Uh, certain hairdos, certain hairstyles. Uh, you know, the jerry curl is really overtaken first by the flat top, ugly. Uh, braids, ugly for criminals. Uh, dreadlocks, for the most part, ugly, dirty, nasty. And I see a lot of people who are doing those things, and they're doing it for the same reason. They weren't doing it because they necessarily liked it, but they were doing it because that was popular at the time. And they are just riding the wave. They are just... Uh, lemmings, they're just marching in line. Hut, two, three, four, hut, two, three, four. And yeah, I, I've seen people, uh, myself included, you know, you have this curl, they make fun of you, uh, they snicker at you. And that's fine to me. Um, but that shows us how depraved the culture is. And, you know, you try to shame and embarrass people based on their hairdo, but you don't do that for uh, having babies out of wedlock, uh, having a, a crime rate that's wildly out of proportion, uh, not valuing education dressing like criminals, literally wearing your pants to where people can see your underwear. You know, none of those behaviors are shame, but a certain hairstyle for some weird reason is just reviled by the uh, black establishment, you know, the, the race socialist um, mindset. So I, I found it a little troubling, and, and like I said earlier, when I got into it, I did it because I liked it. You know, I if I really followed what other people said I should think, if I follow what the black establishment, quote-unquote, want you to think, I wouldn't be me. I'd be some lemming uh, Democrat voter that blames all my problems on white people or, or someone else, and, you know, I'd be some big loser. And uh, if, you, um, if you take the opinions of losers seriously, you are a loser. Period. You know, if I cared what other people thought about me, I, I wouldn't be Lord Gord, I'd be, uh, I don't know, a black redneck, you know, because when I came up with this idea to get this hairstyle, a lot of people didn't believe me. I remember one guy asking, like, oh, you're really going to wear that? Like, you, you know, people are going to say things about you. I'm like, man, so what? D do you live your life based on the whims of other people? Uh, do you only make decisions based on what other people would think about you? The truth isn't popular sometimes. You know, when, when the world was discovered to be round and not flat. Those are only a few men that discovered that. They had to prove with facts, logic, and evidence that the world wasn't flat and they were in the minority. Um, you know, people will say things like, oh man, it's 2018, you're still doing that? Like, it's 2017 and I see a jerry curl. Oh my goodness, OMG, LOL. I would say probably 99.999999% of people that think like that are idiots. Um, they are not basing 
their conclusions and facts, logic, and evidence. They're they're following a logical fallacy called uh, uh, appeal to popularity. They're saying that because something is popular, it's good. There have been lots of things that have been popular that weren't good. There have been lots of things that most people believe that aren't true. So whether something's true or not, whether an idea is valid or not, is not contingent on whether a lot of people believe it. It's if it is true, if you can test it uh, empirically and see that uh, it comes out to be true after numerous uh, tests, rigorous tests. So, uh, you know, another guy, Justin Trudeau, this fool that runs Canada, you know, he was asked why he wants to make the government 50% women or something along those lines. He said, because it's like 2016. You're an idiot. If you're going to make an argument, you have to you have to make the argument. Uh, can you imagine if someone was making fun of me and, and said, you know, it's blah, blah, blah year. Why are you doing that? It's like, so what you're saying is uh, I'm supposed to fall into collective groupthink and do things not based on what I like or what I find to be true based on facts and evidence. But I'm supposed to do something based on what other people say or think. That to me is ridiculous. Uh, it's utterly ridiculous. Um, an, an example of this uh, collective group thing would be this guy, Baron Davis. Baron Davis was a ball player, and uh, he got a jury curl like a few years ago. And the, 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 kind of, the, the amount of derision and ridicule and scorn that he received on the Internet and among the black establishment was astounding. I mean, they've never shamed any of these players for having babies out of wedlock for committing crimes, for being violent, for having all these thuggish uh, tattoos. No, that doesn't get shame or derision. No, 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 not for the black rednecks, not for the black establishment. What gets shame is wearing your hair in this uh, glamorous, luxurious way that uh, is out of step with the black uh, groupthink, you know. Um, and and that, that really says it all. It, it says, you know, you can't think for yourself. If you do anything outside the norm, bad, 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 we must shut you down. Not because your idea is wrong or it's not true. It's just because you are outside the uh, race socialist mindset. And I've said uh, before, you know, those black websites are some of the worst websites uh, on the planet. They are uh, toxic. Uh, they are rife with identity politics uh, and collectivism. And I've never seen another race do that, at least to that extent. I've never went on Chinese websites where the, the basis of the website is that, you know, we're Chinese. Uh, we have Chinese pride or any of this other crap. Uh, I've never seen it with Hispanics. I'm pretty sure it exists. Uh, you know, it's ridiculous. This, this how these black people just fetishize and celebrate a happenstance of biology. A happenstance of biology is not an achievement. And, and just because we, we, we share a, a similar skin tone uh, doesn't mean that we should all think alike. Uh, it doesn't mean that I can't wear my hair in a certain way or people shouldn't wear their hair in a certain way because the black establishment thinks that it's unacceptable. And uh, I think that people who just blindly follow in line with what others say without evaluating uh, facts, logic, and evidence just aren't smart people. Uh, they're either intellectually lazy or they're just not smart. So to wrap this up here, you know, um, the jerry is great. I mean, I, I, I've been wearing it for a few years. It's low maintenance. It, it's beautiful. It's classy. Um, you know, I get a lot of compliments. Um, and, 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 and most importantly, you don't have to uh, follow into the collectivist group thing. You can make decisions for yourself. I mean, I just find it absurd that almost, well, well, 95% of blacks vote for the Democrats. So maybe it isn't absurd that like 95% of them don't like jerry curls, but you know, maybe there are blacks that like jerry curls or they would wear them, but just the amount of, of ridicule and uh, ostracism that they'd receive uh, deters them from doing that, which is a great irony because they think that doing that for women having babies out of wedlock and uh, being dependent on the government, um, that's not going to have a similar effect. It's nonsense. So in sum, do what you like. Follow the evidence. Make your own decisions. Don't fall into the group thing. Don't fall into the collectivism, the, the race hustling, the, the race socialism. Do what you like. It's beautiful. It's glamorous. All right? They don't pay me for doing it. Maybe, maybe they should pay me for being an endorser for their products because I love them. That's the Lord Gore Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe on iTunes. 
Subscribe on YouTube. Like it. Share it. Leave a comment. Leave a review. Hey, share it with your friends. They might like the Lower Gore Podcast. I like it. Um, <laughs> donate on Patreon. Uh, get the Lord Gord album. This isn't TV. Uh, we have the music video on YouTube. Uh, you can get it on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Tidal, you know, Amazon Music, all major music streaming uh, services, except for Pandora. I don't think it's on Pandora. If you're in LA, come to the airliner, uh, the Blues Jam at the airliner every Tuesday night from 9 p.m. to midnight. It's 21 and over. Free admission, dollar tacos. It's a funky good time. I'm out. Hopey Blues Band. Is it eighth or ninth? I I I I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, pre-sale tickets are ten dollars. Uh, at the door is fifteen dollars. At the Phi Dodo, uh, club in L.A. You can look it up. Phi Dodo, Hopey Blues Band. If you're in L.A., come check it out. It's gonna be fun. I'm gonna be uh shucking and jiving and one and two. So it's going to be a good time. Next week, we're going to talk about labor unions, the history of labor unions, their purpose, the economic effects, uh, the myths of labor unions, so on and so forth. That's going to be a really interesting podcast. So be back here with me next week at 8 a.m. And we'll have a funky good time. I'm Lloyd Gord. I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>